Hey, Stephen Priest here with Class1ModelWorks.com. We help people build state-of-the-art model roads. So I want to talk to you to today about one of the most fantastic cars uh, that ever uh, graced the rails, and that is the General Steel Castings, or GSC, heavy-duty flat cars. These were an amazing car because uh, back when they were created, there were a lot of cars that were still built uh, with, with basically a metal casting, a single metal casting, instead of fabrication. Uh, most of our cars this day and age are fabricated, which means they take uh, steel shapes uh, and steel plate and weld them together to get the overall dimensions and form of the car. There will still be castings on that, but the entire car is in a casting, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. So we're going to start with the Santa Fe car. This is the ATSF 90,000. Uh, it was a one-car order that was ordered as a kit, which many of these cars were ordered as. And before I get too far, I want to point out some really neat things on this car. The first thing is, is that it has a, a transformer on it. It's got a big uh, gray transformer. And that transformer is being held to the deck by plates here that were actually welded onto the deck of the car. The interesting thing about this load is, is you will notice that when they put the transformer on the car, they actually painted the transformer on the car. And the reason we can tell this is because all of the structural shapes here that were welded to the car are the same color as the transformer, which means they painted it in place, which is really interesting. Also, you'll notice, if you can see, on these, these tie-down rods, the paint goes down a ways on them and then it just turns to bare steel. You'll notice, uh, and I want to point this out too, because a lot of loads that were placed on these heavy-duty flat cars uh, the tie rods, which is, you know, these that run down in each corner, were actually fastened to the deck of the car through a hole. So they drilled a big hole, or more than likely torch cut a big hole through here, and then they tied that rod underneath that. And we'll show you some examples of that later. You can see it a little better here on the other end of the car, right here, because you can see the rod passing through the car, down through the hole, and then you can see the cap piece uh, on the bottom of that flange. And these cars were designed with this flange in place, very intentionally, realizing uh, that loads would have to be tied down to that deck uh, because that's the only way that they would keep such large loads in place. So that's the Santa Fe car. Now, here's the Santa Fe car again. This is a little earlier in its life. So as I mentioned before and earlier, these kits were cast by GSC, uh, the cars, and then they were delivered to a lot of the railroads as kits the railroads took them into their shops and they built them, uh, fitted them out in the, uh, in the shops. Uh, the Santa Fe car was interesting because it had early roller bearings. It had SKF bearings, these larger bearings. These were later changed out uh, for common roller bearing caps, which, which we see now on most cars, including, uh, of course, all the, the modern cars that we see on a regular basis. But this was an early, early roller bearing type, this, these SKFs. The Santa Fe used them on a lot of their passenger car equipment. And this particular car in the early 50s, when this was built, uh, received that treatment as well. You'll notice that everything you see up here on this car, minus the plumbing, the brake line plumbing, is a single piece casting. Uh, so this entire car body is not fabricated or welded together. It is a casting, which is amazing. I'd hate to even have a guess at what that, uh, what that weighed. So there you can see the overhead cranes in the, in the shops there, in the Topeka shops uh, above there, uh, have this on huge pieces of chain, and they're getting ready to, to lower it onto the truck. So uh, the vast majority of these cars, again, were home built in, in railroad shops. And because of that, there is some variation from car to car to car. Uh, but we've included a lot of those variations in our, in our model. And one of the things I wanted to point out on this particular car is, and this is one of the things that changes, and that is these jack pads right here. This little U-shaped object with the dark in the middle of it, that's a jack pad. So this car can be taken into the, into the shop, a floor jack can be put in, it can be lifted up by that jack. So that's a jacking point, much like you have on automobiles, uh, you know, places where you can jack your car and where you can't. A lot of the times, that jack pad would be right here in this curve, uh, on, on a lot of the cars, and I'll point that out later. So we've done both versions of those jack pads, and we've also done a non-jack pad version because there was a version of this car that did not have uh, jack pads at all. So here's another transformer load, and we're going to talk about it here. Uh, again, you'll notice that the, the decks, because they were left bare metal in what we call the well of the deck, uh, is always littered with all kinds of steel welded all over to it. You see all these steel shapes and things? Because load after load after load, you know, they would put, they would set the transformer or whatever the piece of machinery was, 
down onto the deck and then they would weld these flanges or angles or I-beams or whatever around that to keep it in place. And then of course they'd come back like we mentioned earlier and tie that down with metal rotting generally through the 45 section, the kind of the gooseneck here of the car and, uh, and fasten it that way. Uh, this car here has the uh, the A-frame, which or the A-style jack pad, which is right here, unlike the Santa Fe car. We kind of call it an A because the hole in it is kind of A-shaped, and that's what it was referred to uh, in the paperwork as well. So this car would be jacked up at this location here, unlike the Santa Fe car. Another thing that a lot of railroads would do is they would go back and they would add all types of tie-down points to the cars. You'll notice here there's, there's a bunch of little metal rings all along this flange here, and those were placed there just so you could attach things, change chains, um, any type of rope that would use, or cabling, or banding, or strapping. Uh, you could be, could be passed through there. These upper raised end decks on the car were very commonly used to hold um, other equipment that was being shipped with the transformer. So it, you know, it's, very, it's very common for a transformer like this to have several crates that were just nailed onto these. These, as delivered, these were oak boards up here, and uh, so they would nail things onto them, tie things down. Sometimes you'll see other pieces of equipment there, uh, as long as the car capacity uh, was such that it could handle that. This particular car, I want to point out a couple things. They've cut to the oak here and they put an, an H column there, so they tied a load down at one time with that. And then down at this end, you'll see some of the oak boards are missing. And more than likely what happened there is they had a load on this car that they had to tie down at that point. So they welded some metal uh, I-beams or H columns or L column or something into these areas where they had removed the, uh, the oak decking. And of course, they, they never put it back on, uh, which it was kind of a common theme. A couple other things I want to mention. This car has uh, the typical roller bearings. So it, uh, originally, it was probably delivered with solid bearings or friction bearings and those were changed out at some point. That's very common in these cars. Our first run of the cars, we are doing the roller bearing versions. The second one, we will be doing some other bearing versions as well. We haven't decided how many, but we're at least gonna do a solid uh, bearing version of that and another truck, but we'll talk about that here after a while. Uh, common paint things, you'll notice the A end is called out on this car, which is the A end of the car, because the, the two ends of the car are virtually identical. Some other things here, you've got some packing data, which means bearing data right here, lube data which generally shows when the, the car's roller bearings or solid bearings last were maintained. And uh, then there's a, a handbrake, a staff brake right here on each end of the car. A lot of the times these were left in their raised position. They were drop staff brakes, so you could kick a little, a little pawl out and the, and the uh, pawl, P-A-W-L, out of the way. And then the, that staff brake would actually drop down and down level with the deck of the car. So if you had loads that would hang out over the car a little bit, they would, uh, they would be handled that way. Another interesting thing is you'll notice the high wide load, which is a high dollar, high value load, has been in place next to the caboose in this particular train. So a lot of the times, either the, uh, uh, the caboose or the motive power uh, were uh, situated very close to these cars so they could keep a, a, a close eye on the, uh, on the high dollar loads. Here's an Erie car. This, I'm sure, is a builder's photograph of the Erie 7268. Uh, beautiful car, looks like they've got some snow. You got a, an Alco switcher working in the background there. Couple things, um, this end has got the brake wheel dropped. You can see it right here, so it's been dropped down. The reason you can tell is the little nub or the, the stand, the staff, these are also called staff brakes, but the staff is sticking down, straight down. You can see it here behind the air hose. The other end of the car, however, uh, they have it in the raised position. So probably when they set the brakes on this car for the photographs, they uh, only tied the brake on one end. Uh, uh, most freight cars now have mechanisms, the rod mechanisms run through the car, so when you tie a handbrake, it sets the brakes on both ends. Because of the complex shape of this car, it would be not impossible but difficult to make a brake mechanism where you, if you tied the handbrake on one end of the car, the force is transferred clear through this interesting shape, clear to the other end to set the brakes on this end of the car. So uh, they opted instead to have two handbrakes on the cars. And um, there would be times that, that you definitely would need to set those. So this truck here, the GSC truck, has got the solid bearings 
on them or what a lot of people call friction bearings. So that's an earlier type of truck. And again, there were several truck designs and we'll talk about that toward the end of the, of the presentation here. Again, the BN is called out really clearly. Um, the reason you have A end and B end called out on a freight car is if I have this in my train and I get a hot box, let's say that uh, this journal right here uh, fails in route and becomes a hot box. In other words, it basically catches on fire. <laughs> um, in order to tell people intelligently what had failed, uh, we need to have a, num a numbering system and we need to say on what end of the car. So you can say bearing one, two, three, four, five, six on the A end or the other end of the car. And, and uh, normally the numbering uh, deals with facing the B end of the car and then the right hand side and left hand side, one, two, three, four, five, six. So uh, B end uh, truck or A end truck and then the numbers are counted up. Uh, that's an interesting research project if any of you are sitting around and wanting to uh, understand how they, they number bearings. It's a very important part of railroading. Here's another car. This is another fresh car right out of the shop. Again, you'll notice it's got the, the, uh, the jack point, the lift pad right here. Um, you'll also notice the wood deck on it. Uh, one of the things that I love looking at on brand new cars, this car is obviously fresh right out of the shop, is how sloppy the paintwork was. So look at this C and EI 4300 on the end and how it goes downhill on the end of the car. One of the things that a lot of us railroaders and model railroaders don't want to face is the fact that these are industrial machines. You know, this is no different than your air conditioner sitting outside of your house to the railroad. It is simply a machine that they do work with. Uh, so they didn't take time to really make a lot of these things pretty or even take time to even put the lettering on straight. And I know as modelers, we want to make things in our brains perfect because we have this kind of a, this design paradigm of perfection. But I wanted to point that out because of the fact that on the real railroad, man, I've seen some horrible things come through. I used to pull pins at the hump in Argentine. In other words, when cars would go up over the hump and I would disconnect the cars so the cars could roll down into the bowl. And so I used to look at paint schemes all day long and it is amazing what actually is out there. <laughs> So even on brand new cars like this, you're going to end up with things like that. You also have some paint overspray right here. I don't know if you can see it. And uh, then uh, the main lettering is done fairly well. It's on fairly straight as well. Chicago and Eastern Illinois is what this car is, by the way. So if you remember, like in the last slide, we were talking about how railroads uh, felt it was extremely important to be able to have their crews, the train crews, identify bearings. Uh, that was actually so important that a lot of the time the cars would not only be labeled by A end and B end, which you'll notice in this particular car, the B end is right, labeled right above the knuckle or above the coupler here. And this is the right side of the car, so you have bearings R1, R2, R3, and then 4, 5, and 6 are on this end on this truck. That way, if we had a bearing failure, I could definitely, in my bad order card report, I could say, hey, bearing number R3 was hot and uh, when we inspected it and we set it out. That way, hours later when it cools off, when, when, the, when the, uh, the mechanical crew shows up with another wheel set or another bearing, they don't go out to the car and go, well, we can't find anything wrong. Well, that, that's, that's why, is because these are labeled to document. And on these larger cars, it was often confusing the crews as of to how the bearing count uh, was handled, even though it's exactly the same as on four axle cars. And obviously this is a six axle car. So another thing I want to point out here real quick, a couple other things, really neat things about the car. Um, you'll notice our airline runs down through the jack pad, uh, bends down and runs along the car here, and clear down to the other end of the car, back up, and into that end of the car. Because of the complex shape of this car, and the fact it's a one-piece casting, it's not solid, it's a hollow casting, but inside of this car there's all kinds of bulkheads and things that, that are cast into the car. So running plumbing through the well or the deck here the, the, uh, uh, is, was really problematic. So the, the airlines and things were run along the outside of the car. That also has another thing that's super helpful and that is if this car does have some type of a mechanical failure in the airlines, it's out where it can be repaired. In other words, instead of being inside the cast car, the cast frame of the car, uh, those accoutrements are on the outside of the car where the uh, maintenance away, not maintenance away, maintenance mechanical crews can get to them. So, very interesting car. Um, here's a tack pad or a tack board right here. This is where they would uh, 
basically staple uh, home shops or do not hump or any of the messages that need to be delivered to train crews in the field or even your bad order tag. Um, if I was on a train and we had a hot box on this and we'd go out and we'd staple or place there or in the, in the tube, some of these cars have a tube, um, we would put the bad order information there. One final thing on this car, you'll notice that because it's cast, all along the frame here, you've got these little triangular fillets in here, all these little kind of weird looking little ribs. That's all cast for strength, so it creates strength in the members of the car. And of course, we've got pulling pockets uh, in the corners of the car so that you can pull the car. It's a practice that uh, long ago has died. Here's a uh, modernized version of the car. I would, would call this updated. A lot of things happen to these cars. Um, they, they were super heavy duty, as you know, and the railroad didn't haul. They, they weren't used constantly. In fact, I'd probably guess they would spend six months of the year just sitting. But when they did need them, they were super important, especially for industrial steel mill, uh, uh, steel areas like uh, around Pittsburgh on the Conrail and former railroads. So this is the Conrail car. A lot of the same things the same. Um, this car has had uh, obviously roller bearing retrofits and you'll notice this has got a six-sided bearing cap and then here's a three-sided bearing cap. Uh, this car did not receive uh, bearing numbers but it has the information for the springs on the truck. Uh, that's this, this uh, information right here is the information about these springs and how the, the car is sprung which is interesting. Other thing about this car, you can see from this angle, you can see the air reservoir underneath it here, the emergency and service uh, portions of the air reservoir. The same is true on the other end of the car. It's an exact duplicate of this end with just a couple minor changes. The main thing about this car that I wanted to point out is I wanted to point out the cushion draft gear. This cushion draft gear was added to some cars by the railroads or ret retrofitted at a later point in the car. So. Um, we are also going to be doing uh, this equipment at some point as well uh, when we produce these cars. So, um, Staff brake is up on this end. Well, it's actually up on both ends. You can see it here fairly clearly. And then here on the other end, you can see it sticking up here as well, right here. So the interesting shape of the trucks, the GSC trucks, the GSC trucks have a little hump in the middle. And it's interesting because they actually designed the car with a little hump in the frame of the car to clear that, th that hump in the truck. And we'll show you here, that here in a minute. So here's a great shot of that, <laughs> the, the hump in the truck here, and then the hump designed into the car. So they kind of they nest in on one another. So really neat design of a truck, how this works. Um, again, this car has had some extra uh, rings, lift rings and tie down rings added to it. And uh, you'll see here how the airlines on this side, there's two of them run through the, the jack pad here. And you can see some of the opening hollows right here underneath in the car uh, that were basically when the thing was cast, it was cast hollow to keep the, the weight of the car down so you'd have better or higher tear. Um, this is your uncoupling mechanism right here. And in this particular car, you can see the handbrake dropped. So this mechanism right here is the Paul mechanism, P-A-W-L it's called. And that's basically a set of kind of geared teeth with a metal weight on it. So as you crank uh, the brake wheel, those little notches are grabbed by the Paul so that your brake wheel doesn't spin back. In other words, it, it's a latching mechanism so you can tighten the handbrake. These cars had uh, with the, the GSC trucks had brake shoes on the outer ends too so you have an exposed brake beam all the way across the end of the car which is a really really neat visual uh, identifier of the car and then again you'll notice these this has got the uh, the pulling pocket right here and uh, the B end is called out very clearly right here this right here I believe if I can get a good look at it here I believe that is the uh, the retainer valve right here which uh, retains air in the car so you can turn the retainer valve up to a different setting, XD, or so when you're going over uh, heavy mountain territory, you retain more air in your air system, so you have retained braking, more braking. So uh, this little kind of curly Q right here, this L-shaped piece of metal, that is the bleeder valve or bleeder rod, which if you yank on that will open up the brake system. So if you cut this car off in a yard and you want to drain the brakes in it so you can move it around in a yard situation, 
you want to empty the air system in the car so you can just move it around like a, frankly, like a piece of lawn equipment, you know, you're just running around. And that will drain, that'll open the, the uh, valve up and drain all the air out of the car so you can handle it manually in the yard. Uh, <clears throat> again, you'll notice the holes that have been cut here on this 45 piece to secure loads over time. It's not uncommon to see this entire flange here almost completely worn away by cutting and, and uh, the constant modifications for the loads. And <clears throat> one of the things that killed a lot of these cars was not age, because they could be rebuilt easy enough, but the amount of destruction that occurred to the decks by mounting loads on and then cutting the loads off, mounting and cutting and mounting and cutting. Eventually, the, the cars were just pretty much worn down to almost nothing, uh, especially in these flanges, because this flange area here is super important, as we mentioned earlier, to tie loads down. Here's another look at the, uh, the GSC truck. Amazing truck. Uh, it also has a GSC logo on it right here. You'll see the General Steel Castings logo. And oddly enough, the frame of the car has got a General Steel Castings logo right here as well. So I wanted to point this out. Another thing I want to point out in this car, you'll, you'll see the brake rigging. We talked about that earlier. You'll see the jack pad here. But this car has had all of the wood decking removed and it's been replaced with steel grills. Again, since these cars are hollow, they have a lot of openings from the deck through to the trucks underneath. And that makes it really easy to work on them. But the nice thing is, is that once the wood had deteriorated to the point, a lot of roads didn't replace it. They just put steel grating up there. And we'll be showing you here that in, in, a, in a moment as well. This is the other common truck that was found on these uh, cars. This is the Buckeye truck, which is also a, another form of, of uh, three axle truck. And you'll notice initially, originally, this had solid bearings. You see the solid bearing housing here. Um, and when they retrofitted this car with roller bearings, uh, they could get rid of most of the roller bearing cases, except for the, the middle one, which was actually cast into the center uh, mount for the wheel set. So they, they literally had to pull the lid off and put the roller bearing mechanism inside of that. So this is the other truck. We will be doing this truck as well. Um, you'll notice here again is a jack pad location right here on this car. And you'll also notice all the wear and tear here to this flange area. You see all this rust in here. Again, these cars lived a pretty hostile life uh, because in order to load them, you would actually do a lot of tie down to them. Not uh, tie down actually directly to the car by welding stuff onto the car, which is interesting as in its own right. These cars, this Penn Central car, uh, these cars also had a brake stand with a standard brake wheel as of opposed to a brake stand. This was, I, I don't know for sure, we haven't been able to find in our research yet. This was probably a rebuild retrofit, uh, but there is a possibility if these cars were delivered late enough that they were delivered with that in place. And uh, somebody may, uh, may know that in the Penn Central or Penn City and New York Central groups. Uh, let us know, we, we'd really like to know about that and if it was a retrofit or if it was delivered in the car. Again, uh, even though this car does not have the GSC trucks, it still has the interesting eyebrow notch in here. So that again, these cars were cast and they probably had a standard mold to cast them. And so when they cast the car, even though it was gonna get Buckeye trucks, no big deal. They went ahead and cast it with that notch in place. So we've been talking about all the stuff that gets welded to these decks. And this is a down on view. This car still has its wood ends in it. But you'll notice even on the wood ends, there's a bunch of penetrations, and you can see it down here better, a bunch of penetrations where they've mounted steel, uh, you know, through or tied it into the deck. And then, of course, the 45s here. And look at this big old H column sticking out of the, out of the, <laughs> out of the 45 uh, degree deck. And then look at these three big pieces of angle iron welded on there. You'll notice this car, too, has also had its, uh, its openings in the 45 welded closed. So at some point, uh, the Seaboard Coastline did that. Look at the deck here at all of these pieces of metal that are basically welded onto the deck. One of the neat things about this car is we have made the, styrene, the, the deck out of styrene. So you can go get some evergreen shapes and paint them rust and glue them onto that deck. So uh, one of the things about these cars that's cool is they lived really rugged lives, but they always had interesting junk up on the decks. And I can't wait to see what, what you guys as modelers come up with uh, on those decks and you know I mean there's all kinds of stuff there's another piece of angle steel there and a whole bunch of kind of blocking here and actually a bunch of wood just left up on the deck 
Here's some type of a circular tie down right here. You see this, this, this eyelet and there's another one right here. So who knows what type of load this car had on it. And that's the neat thing about it. Just about anything you can imagine was hauled by these cars and we have some amazing pictures of that. Uh, it's really interesting. It it's actually becomes almost laughable at times. Here, here's one of these cars we had mentioned earlier that once the, the wood decks tended to deteriorate, some railroads would replace or refurbish the wood decks. Other railroads just went in and put grating uh, up in here. And the nice thing about the grating is, is that you could pop the, that, that grating out of there and get access to your trucks and all your air, air piping very, very, very easily, which made these cars uh, nice to maintain. Again, if you look at the decks, uh, all this welding and all this junk that's gone on here over time, and again, uh, my theory on these cars is they didn't die a death of, of just running for so long. They, they died a death of having so much stuff welded to them and, and so many holes cut in them. Look at, the, uh, look at all these holes up here and just all the things that had been welded. And you can tell that the deck of this car uh, lived a very, I'm not going to say violent, but very active life. And uh, again, normally in this 45 degree area right here, uh, you're going to end up with a certain amount of holes cut for tying down loads and eventually the, the frames of the car would just were just pretty much done because they had had so much intrusion and so much welding on them that uh, they were they were they were scrapped at that point. Uh, there are some of these cars still running around however. Uh, uh, NS has got a couple and some other roads. I believe the NS has got a couple still. We have some very late pictures of rebuilt NS cars but um, if you guys again if you guys have shots of these love to see them uh, you know in the last 10 years because uh, these cars are amazing. You'll notice here again above the center axle here, you've got, you've got penetrations through the decking where they would tie things down. And then of course, this has got the GSC uh, trucks. One thing I'll point out here is you'll notice that the, uh, the bleeder rod right here is painted white. One of the common things that uh, happens with freight cars, especially in latter years, is those bleeder yards were painted white. A lot of carmen would go along with spray paint and just paint them white so they're easier to see and identify at night. Um, that may be uh, uh, a Federal Railway Administration or AAR uh, ruling or guide that they had to be painted white. I'm not sure and I can't prove that one way or the other. That's another thing that you as uh, watching this, if you, if you guys are a carman or you know why those are painted white, I'm sure it's for visibility, but I don't know if it was required or not uh, by law. So that's the GSC flat car. Uh, in a nutshell, there's a lot to talk about. We could go on for hours and hours and hours because they're, uh, again, a lot of these cars, uh, the vast majority of these cars were built by the railroads in their own shops, which is an amazing feat because it added the flavor of the railroad to the cars. So if you'd like to have one of these in HO scale, they are available right now at class1modelworks.com for pre-sale, uh, sort of pre-order. And so I'll tell you right now, uh, there's some of these that are about halfway sold out. And uh, so they're going fairly fast. Uh, it's an interesting car and people are interested uh, in purchasing them. So we've done a lot of different road names and we've got some interesting features. So when you're on the website, take a look at the details and uh, order away. And remember, at class1modelworks.com, we help people build state-of-the-art model railroads.